chapter 19 on strings on the uh, web page. And if, the, if there's enough time at the, after the student presentations, I'll say some more things about strings. Okay, go. All right, David, so, so Julian and I spent the last like eight weeks working, um, looking at supervision and working, working on actually using machine learning ideas to, to model certain techniques and supervision. So I'm going to just start real quick and go through um, go through a little bit of background of what super resolution is. And does anybody know what it is? Did, you know, well, it, yeah. It's yeah, like you you does. you know what it is. You know what it is. But the, the students and the students know what it is in general. Oh, hey, let me make an <laughs> announcement. Hold on. Next Thursday, a week right. from today, at three thirty, there's a, a lecture in Reagan Hall, room one hundred and three, the big lecture hall, public lecture on super resolution microscopy by a Nobel laureate whose yeah, name talk, I forgot. We're talk about a bit about so. It, super resolution is sort of a, a, like an umbrella term for any any system or or any family of systems where information is tra transferred for, from one point to another point, and, and that is information is then read or deciphered or something. There's there's a resolution to that system. So how how well can that the original amount of information that was transferred be resolved? Right. So we're interested in our case in what Kevin was just saying uh, in microscopy, super resolution microscopy. So there's two. There's two main areas of super resolution across me. The first one is the one that we're interested in here is stochastic super resolution, and that's like what Keith Ricky does. Um, he works in the, um, the the type of stochastic super resolution he does is called STORM. It stands for stochastic optical reconstruction microscopy. Um, we're going to talk about that because that's sort of what we are doing. We're just doing it computationally instead of experimentally. And the, the one that the Nobel laureate is going to talk in next week is deterministic super resolution. The one that he did was, at, it's actually called STED, and it stands for uh, Stimulated Emission Depletion Microscopy, I think. And it's th this one is a lot more experimental than this one, where this one almost inherently uses more computational techniques. But basically what it is is, we'll move on to the next one. So, we take we have a, we we put fluorophores inside of, inside of a cell or a sample that we want to image. A fluorophore is a chemical. To just be really simple with it, it's a molecule. A, it's a molecule, <laughs> it, it, but it, so it, it can fluoresce and it can single photon fluoresce, right? So we, we put it in there, and it, it will bind to to things inside of the cell. It, it, it will be called binding sites. Without getting too much into that, pretty much what we do is we you know we're limited by resolution by. Um, it's fraction, but we, we sort of sidestep these resolution limits with, with, su with these super resolution techniques and essentially take a bunch of shitty images and then and then put them all together for images that aren't as bad. Um, so there's a little description, a little bit more of a technical description of, of how uh, stochastic super resolution happens and what sort of what we do with it. I don't, uh, I don't want to get really involved with technical jargon, but it's not really important. This. He'll do that. Um, the, our motivation for wanting to do this was if we make some fairly basic physical assumptions about the way that these fluorophores diffuse inside the sample, so that it, if we assume that they're restricted to a, a pretty small region near um, uh, near the boundaries, but away away from any any type of internal obstruction, so internal interactions can be minimized, I guess. We tried to come up with a toy model to uh, so that for it, it rely, the theory relies on the, and I'm actually going to write down the equation, this, the standard diffusion equation for the probability. So this is the diffusion equation. Yeah, this is a standard, and we're assuming a two-dimensional diffusion equation. So R R is just an x and y. So we, we assume that um, the, the, the diffusion of, of the fluorophores inside of the cell obeys this equation, and, and that's just the general solution. I'm sure all of you have solved this equation at some point to, to get that. It's just a, a normalized calcium. The, the reason for the four pi, the normalization constant, is because there's two variables. And so what that, what that is saying, though, is that the probability to find the ith fluorophore 
about the IF binding site of mu is, is given as a Gaussian. So they distribute, the, the fluorophores distribute around the binding sites in, in a Gaussian manner. Right? And this is, physically, this is because it's, it's a random process. This is just a random law. Right? So that, that is kind of a, uh, in our toy model, what a particular four for an individual four four would look like as it's diffusing through the cell, starting somewhere over here along zero zero, and you know eventually finding a binding site. Yeah, yeah. And so, so the, we we want to take Julian will talk about what a Gaussian process is and, and go through the machine learning portion of this. But this motivates this motivated us to ask: Can we can we take the ideas from machine learning and, and, and analytical methods of Gaussian processes? actually do this image reconstruction for the stochastic super resolution just, um, strictly computationally. Can we replicate the results computationally? And so we gave that a try and under our really simplistic assumptions we got some actually pretty good results and I guess Julian can, can go with it. Alright, so uh, a Gaussian process is uh, is not just a, a Gaussian distribution as many people might, might assume and as I've actually seen used improperly in literature. A Gaussian process is a continuous uh, random field. So imagine kind of like, like the electric field on a plane or something, um, where at every point x, y, continuously it is defined. The thing that makes it a Gaussian process is if that random field, if you take any finite collection of points, they, are, they have a joint Gaussian distribution and all marginals are Gaussian, okay? So take, so from the continuous uh, space, take any finite number of points, just randomly pick points, or however it is you want to pick them, and those points have a, have a Gaussian distribution, joint Gaussian distribution. So, uh, examples... Do you mean in time the things are Gaussian, or do you... In whatever space it is you need them to be. Uh, here we're considering space. But if you have a finite number of points, why is it Gaussian? Well, you have a finite number of points uh, that, that uh, represent uh, random variables that jointly have a random... Uh, that are Gaussianly distributed. Right. So you're, you're going in some other variable that each of those so, points at a given instant of something or other is somewhere else. So let's say there's a Gaussian, uh, there's a random field here, and I take some points, and the, the Gaussian process is that with these as means of distribution, with those points as being the means of the distributions, the joint distribution of random variables of the Gaussian process is itself a Gaussian. Yeah, what point you go on? Yeah. So Gaussian processes occur in different different things. Like for instance, uh, in if you consider like you know all of the possible uh, you know financial indices there are, or all the ones that you could choose, the ones we have we know to to, be, to behave in some sort of a Brownian fashion, right? That's kind of a popular model in finance. So you know we got Gaussian processes in in finance. Uh, the ones that we're actually interested in this, and this is really just to point out another example of a common use that you could uh, think about. The one we're considering is the diffusion of the fluorophores, right? Um, so here's the model. So we have uh, some function y, okay, and uh, it's a function of the of the random variables, uh, Gaussian random variables. Uh, sorry, it's, it's some it's some function. It's some known. It's some it's some function. It doesn't actually have to be known. In general, it's not epsilon. That's the noise. That's Gaussian distributed. So uh, the idea now is that the joint distribution over all variables is Gaussian. This phi is uh, it's a transformation so that you can have in general a nonlinear dependence on the x's. It doesn't have to be just a linear dependent. It can be any sort of dependence you want. Uh, and that's the likelihood. Um, the prior, this is uh, the important part. The Gaussian process is a Bayesian model. 
as such, it must have a prior. Now, since uh, Kevin went over this, I'm just going to assume that everybody remembers what it is. We well, can re-explain it if you want. Well, okay. Um, so, well, there is a dry eraser of a small size somewhere. Well, this is fine for now. So, I meant an eraser. But I just need, you know, this space here. It's fine. So, let's say we have, and you know, for a, we have a joint distribution of some variable x and some variable theta. Okay. Uh, here, the way we're going to want to think about it is that x is the independent random variable, theta is a parameter or a set of parameters. If this is Gaussian, for instance, then x is just the random variable, and theta represents the mean and the standard deviation. Okay. So um, then we can break it into, we can do this, right? We can, uh, uh, any, any, uh, any joint distribution can be broken up into the margin of the, uh, the conditional distributions times the, uh, times the uh, marginal distributions. Now, since this, this has to be go both ways, you can't have a special treatment for one variable over the other. Well, that can also be written as P of theta given x times P of x. Right? Same thing. Now, uh, what, what you really want is uh, Yeah, so what we have is, then what we can say is, uh, just equating these two, if we solve for this, we have P of X given theta, P of theta over P of X. That's phase theorem. So to, to parse this, what it says is, this function is called the likelihood. This is uh, the, uh, the conditional. Uh, it's a conditional distribution in x. It's not a distribution in theta, right? That's why it's called the likelihood function, the likelihood of theta of, of the uh, of the data. It's not necessarily a function uh, distribution in the uh, parameters. This is this is called a prior, right? So this is where we put in our previous knowledge of the parameters, anything that we think could actually reflect the reality of the parameters. In fact, some Bayesians take it a step further and just say it doesn't even need to reflect the reality. This is just what I think could happen. And actually, in practice, a lot of simple Bayesian models just pick uh, P of theta such that it's easy to work with, right? Uh, and then this is just for normalization, right? And so now this is called the posterior distribution. So this tells us, you know, this, uh, we can do a lot of stuff with this because it's a distribution. So uh, it's a proper distribution in theta, not necessarily x, right? One, analogous to that. So um, a lot of things, a point estimate, for instance, is to maximize this with respect to theta. So that that would be the mode of the distribution. And you know, for a lot of a lot of things, that's actually a good uh, a good estimate. There's different types of estimators, but um, what we're gonna, what you know, to keep it simple, a lot of times you can just do. A, a simple map estimate is what it's called, map for maximum posteriority. So, okay, so then that's a prior, and that's a posterior. You can, the computations are tedious, but they're straightforward. You can do them, it's just, they're just tedious, but this is what it breaks down to. And it turns out that this is a posterior mean, okay? And then uh, this is the precision, so the pros the precision and, uh, and, and variance, or in this case covariance, are just uh, reciprocals of, one each other, of, of each other. So if standard, uh, you have a standard deviation of sigma, the precision is 1 over sigma. Meaning, um, if you have a very large variance, then any sort of, uh, the variable can take on, the, with high probability, a, a large range of values, right? Making it a not very precise. Now the op can, uh, opposite. So let me show you some examples about what can happen with uh, what you can do with Gaussian processes. Imagine you had maybe like a voltage reading somewhere, 
that you have reason to believe is Gaussian distributed, that you can, and that it, that under reasonable assumptions of your physical system, you can justify a Gaussian process. So then some examples here would be, well, you know, let's have like an underlying true thing f of x, that's the actual like real function that you would want to get at. And that would be the mean of the process, right? That's the mean of the process. It's, it's, that is like eventually what you would want to get at, right? If you made, if you maximize this with respect to theta, you would actually get f of x. That's, that's the goal. So the yellow dots, the scattering, it, are measurements, right? And then uh, the blue continuous curve, which is kind of hard to see because it actually fits pretty well with, under the black curve. So you know it's kind of hard to see because of that. But that's a good thing, right? Yeah, so because of the light in here, it's like you can sort of see it if you look over on the, the left side, side between the yeah, yeah. left side and here. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, let me, let me interrupt for a second. How many students are intending to speak today? I'll hurry up. All right. All right. Yeah. 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 Hurry up. Okay. So, anyways, uh, so then the the estimate from the Gaussian process that we that we discussed is the blue curve. Even though that's the data. Imagine if you saw that data, would you be able to guess that that the, the blue curve would look that good? No. So what happens when you have less data? Well, the less information you have, the worse your estimate. Oh, by the way, that shaded blue area is the uh, region of like your 95% uh, confidence level. So that's really small because we have a lot of data. If you, don't, if you only have like a little bit of data, then kind of that kind of goes to crap, right? But nonetheless, the effect of the prior helps keep these regions finite and to within like a decent level. So, you know, then another example of the same thing. So this is kind of what you can expect from your mean squared error as you have more data, right? This is the kind of behavior that makes sense. Looks kind of like one of our square roots. Square root of n, hopefully. Uh, yeah, right. Anyways, now that I've kind of given you a feel of what the Gaussian processes do and what we care, why we care about them, Let's show you some of the, from my, our toy model of super resolution, the, this is what we can say. Now, this is, the blue curve is the underlying truth, the black dots. I just screwed up, I w gave it very small variance, so it already kind of looks good. <laughs> uh, that was my mistake, I'm sorry. Uh, but this actually also showcases one of the things in stochastic super resolution, which is when the floor fours blink on and off, in one snapshot, you see them. In another, you don't because they're off. So this has missing data. This is actually trying to use a median filter to fill in the data. So lesson is don't use it because it's crap. Um, it doesn't work. And uh, these are the reconstructions. These are our estimates of those centers, right? So the, the idea here is that there's some point on the curve and they bind with the Gaussian distribution around that, around that point. So here is the estimates of those points. And then we can do parameter estimation. These curves are, you know, these are functions that we can write down. So the idea is now, okay, so can we guess the numbers that go in front of the variables, right? Like the coefficients of like a polynomial, for instance, which is actually what you're looking at. And so uh, we do an optimization process for that. And uh, there's several curves because there's a thing called uh, regularization, which is kind of true, a way of reflecting, kind of a prior in a sense, which is a way of reflecting what we believe to be true about the curve and some of the characteristics it should satisfy. So you can see that some are really bad, but some are pretty good. The two best estimates, look at that, pretty good. So how is this super resolution not just like a simple point estimate? Because when you, uh, because when you can actually find the uh, par like the parameters that correspond to a member of a parametric family, then you can sample the polynomial. You can write it down at any scale you want. So you can go in as fine detail as you would like. And uh, that's it for our toy example. We'll put in remarks. Uh, a lot of things are Gaussian. I guess we already know that as physicists, we it's pretty much all we do. Um, Analytic, analytic tractability. Okay. All right, that's great. Let's
see now uh, who wants to go next. Okay. All right. So good job. Thanks. Nice. Uh, we're going to try to implement yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah, that's how you take that. Idea. So are you talking with Keith Whitkey or somebody? No, well, not yet. We're planning to over the summer. Right now, we were just trying to learn something. So we learned something, so that's cool. Keith is the local expert. If you have an apple, here. Well, oh, you've got one that. Oh, wait a minute. No, 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 no. no. Yeah. That's right. Okay, that goes to HTML. I'm curious. Where did you get this? Moshi. What do you call it? Yes. Is it plugged in all the way? It looks like it's trying to. Well, let me call Tom. No, I don't think. It was working this morning. There should be nothing wrong with it. Yeah. yeah. There we go. <laughs> Um, and then, so, 
one of the things that, okay, the question you asked during class is, what if it's a higher order power? So that's what I want to look at. And I looked at both of these, because both of them are interesting in different ways. So actually, let's look at this guy. Uh, just to show you how it's different. There we go. So you can see it still bifurcates, it still has chaos, but it's slightly different because it's zero along here, and then it bifurcates, and uh, you get all of this. So what's the difference different. between the two graphs? Um, X minus one, one minus X. That's it. Right. Oh, so the first graph was. I thought both of them were the one minus XL. Yeah, so this one here. Well, oh, that's the that's the standard one. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so then I went. What you I use this instead, and, and well, I used both. Oh, 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 oh this so is cool. I took these to some power. Now, originally, I went with whole numbers, and we'll look at a few of those. But before I go on to those guys, I want to talk about um, a little bit of the features that people have looked into. So, going with this guy. That's very interesting behavior. Yeah. Was there a racer one here somewhere? Yeah, there, there is a small eraser that doesn't seem to be here. Oh, yeah, they're there. Right there. I got it. Yeah, the erasers are always hiding. So the color represents the L index? The, the N uh, Yes, it does. Yeah, what do the colors represent again? I didn't so, understand. So if you're so between 1 and, five, one, one and 1 and 1.5, that's the, the function just uh, lives between those two. Yes. So that was something I wanted to talk about after I talked about this guy. So the idea is that in the limit that L goes to infinity, this number converges to something. And that's true definitely in this region. I mean, it's a boring number. It converges to zero. But then, and the whole reason why we're interested in this subject, is that when you get to a certain region, it no longer converges to a point. It really converges to two points. And then a little bit later, it converges to four points, and then eight points, and then keeps on getting bigger. So what and we're plotting is, is, the, is what the sequence converges to, different R's? Uh, presumably. And so a, same, a same starting point? Or? I kept iterations 500 to 599. So if I kept one iteration, it would have uh, been very boring to do that. So, So it kept two iterations. So this is a different one. Um, this is for n equals 1 and m equals 4. And you can see that the yellow one is the second bifurcation, well, the second iteration. There's also a red one. You can see it's one. Um, so keeping one iteration. And then I also have this map. So, okay. one, four. so this is what happens when you take it to a higher power. It's gorgeous images. Yeah, very nice. I, I liked I like doing this. Um, so you can see this very similar logistics map. You can see, interestingly, the behavior you didn't see earlier was that this kind of like goes to zero, but it stays. What's interesting are these funny white gaps. I have. So you get chaos in these regions, but then huh? at a certain point, they become. Um, like the, it's no longer chaos in this region. And you can see it starts to bifurcate the rest of it. All right, so what I want to talk about is Feigenbaum's constant, or one of them, because he actually has a number of constants named after So this is called different things, but I'm going to call this one delta. Delta is about equal to uh, 4.692. It's conjectured, it's a transcendental number. Um, so, how do you get this guy? Is you take the distance from bifurcation to the next bifurcation, and then you divide it by the distance of the this bifurcation to the next bifurcation. And technically, how it goes is that so I'm going to call one of them L sub L, and the next one is L L sub one and L capital L. There's just the length, and in the limit that L goes to infinity, this guy approaches delta. And this isn't just true for the logistics map. This actually is true for many processes 
where some sort of period doubling occurs. All right, we've got this guy. So now let's explore our parameter space a little bit. So why should those be whole numbers? So I had some examples. I took uh, here is they're both equal to 0.9. Um, and you can see a very strange behavior. So you have bifurcation. But then, oh, I should also mention this one, unlike any of the other ones, this is actually the imaginary part of the function. Because once you start taking fractional powers, you get imaginary components. Um, so you can see there's this tiny region of chaos and then some very strange behavior. Um, and then uh, something that's power greater than one, there's actually no chaos here. It bifurcates, but, you know. So they, there's some very interesting behavior going on here. One of the things is that for some of these processes, and I was thinking about trying to, uh, oh yes. Um, I was thinking of trying to calculate Feigenbaum's amounts kind of support, but it wasn't a really good way to demarcate when, at least the way I wrote the program, when it bifurcates. So it's very hard to calculate in a very in a particular way. So what's very interesting, oh, this is one of the ones that has a tiny title. So when one of these numbers becomes less than 0.5, so this one is 0.1 for n and 0.7 for n. When those become less than 0.5, they actually no longer diverge out in regions in large R. They actually converge to some sort of function. To what? To some sort of function. I don't know. Um, but for particular values, you still, if we look at this guy, get a tiny region of chaos. I know this is where you're kind of scattering out the lattice here, but this is actually the bifurcation map in the very not so fine detail. All right? And let's see what else do we have for you guys. Okay, so the one we want to look at first is this one, where once we go above R here, this is actually diverted. So there's no more data beyond this. Now it looks like there might be a little something here. This is just a line converging to a line over here. So you can see you've got some stable map. It bifurcates, but then it doesn't look like there's anything. But if you zoom in, and we we'll want to this guy, if you zoom in right on the endpoints, you can see. And this is very zoomed in, like we're going from uh, 0.005 to 0.06 here, and this is 0.01 over here. See, right on the tail point, there's a tiny one just All right, so I do have more pictures, but uh, in the interest of time, I think I better in here. Well, they're lovely pictures. All right, who's next? Why don't you uh, send me something? Sure. And on. send it to the grader also. Who's next? Um, All, right. All right. And you don't have to give a computer talk. Yeah. You want I want you to do a blackboard. Yeah, I don't actually have a PowerPoint or pictures or anything. Okay, so uh, should I do it up here? Or? Yeah, let's turn the lights on then. Do you know how to turn the projector off for a moment? Cool. <laughs> All right, so what I wanted to talk about a little bit, for just a little bit, was uh, quantum Monte Carlo methods. Uh, just go a little bit more into detail about them and spend some time talking about a specific kind of implementation of them called the loop algorithm. So, real quick, um, well, what this is kind of um, ultimately going for is say you have uh, some thermal state This is a Hamiltonian that describes the interactions in your system. This is the inverse temperature. And Z, just to remind everybody, is the partition function, which is the trace of that. And we put that in there to normalize this uh, 
mercê. And so, in order to just sort of focus us a little bit, I'm going to talk about a particular Hamiltonian. What I'm going to talk about can be applied to other ones. You have to be kind of careful about what ones you're using in particular, but um, uh, generally speaking, this can be used for well, a wide array of spin systems and um, some other things that I wasn't familiar with, so I'm not going to talk about them. Right, so, I'm just going to talk about Hamiltonian, that's sort of the sum of interactions of neighboring spins, right? So we're just going to call n spins. Basically, there are nearest neighbor interactions uh, in uh, the S, um, all, all the spin operators. Um, they can have the same strength for the spin X operators and spin Y operators. And this H is not Planck's constant, it's just a strength in the magnetic field. All right, and so. Uh, the first thing we want to do to this Hamiltonian is sort of uh, break it up into commuting pieces. The reason that we're doing this is later we're going to go over something called the world line model, uh, sort of a representation of what this state, well, a representation approximating that state uh, that uses um, a bunch of, uh, they call plaquettes, which you might remember from uh, little squares. Yes. You might remember from talking about uh, quantum static really. And so, um, you can actually just sort of break this into the even and the odd terms for J. So, each even equals some even, and then each odd you define some. Right. So. Getting to where that's actually a useful thing to do, we won't get to for a little, but um, it does become very useful later. So the first thing we want to think about doing um, is just how do we actually even calculate this partition function. And once we've found out a way to calculate that partition function, we'll actually be able to use that kind of to hop to calculating other observables. So, right, so just Writing out what we have for uh, to trace. Uh, since we've broken up our Hamiltonian into the even and odd terms and they commute, we can. Why do they commute? Um, if you uh, actually. Um, well, I haven't actually done it myself, but I. Uh, I mean, they may, I don't know, but. Uh, in other words, if j is even, then j plus 1 is odd, right? Yeah. So, um, so I mean, it, they may commute, but it's not obvious to me. Uh, should we actually go over showing if they commute, or? They do. They really uh, do. That's, that's what I think. Swear to God. <laughs> that's what the paper told me. So uh, I will put my trust in that thing. All right, let's, let's assume it's true. OK. All right. So, yeah, let's assume that they uh, commute. Um, I suppose actually with what we're going to do, um, kind of doesn't necessarily uh, matter if they commute. Uh, we can sort of, we'll end up effectively approximating that. Uh, doing something similar, I think, to things that you've done in class. Um, so, so, if we, Break those up. 
it's not going to be immediately obvious why we should do something like this. Well, the trace, of course, has special properties, so it could be that even if they don't commute, you could All right, go on. Yeah, okay. I see what you yeah. Yeah, so uh, what we've done is we've kind of changed from beta to this uh, tau parameter, and tau is equal to beta divided by LT. So we... Where, where L is a huge integer. Yes, L is a huge integer. So I suppose we can... Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Right. So that works whether or not these things commute. Yeah. Yeah. I think that might ultimately be the important factor. No, that is ultimately. All right, so the um, fact that I've written tau is probably a little bit suggestive. Um, you might remember from class, Dr. Cahill often talked to in Statnik about considering beta to be uh, an imaginary time, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, still what that means we aren't going to quite get to, but uh, this is sort of what eventually gets us there. Right? And just because uh, I'm, going to be writing, I'm going to be writing this particular quantity a lot, I'm going to call it Q so that we just can go over that a lot quicker. Right. And so trace, um, you may remember, can be defined. Um, so if we have some sort of basis, or a set of basis vectors over our uh, uh, whole spin chain, we can sort of, and we'll just denote that set of basis vectors by J1. Yeah, so, and summing over the dimension of our system, Q is the power of LT, J1. All right, and so then I'm going to do another thing that might not seem all that helpful at first, but it eventually gets us to something that we can actually work with. And that's I'm going to insert a resolution of the identity in this basis in between all of these Qs. Right, so I'm going to have the sum over J1 all the way to So we're doing sum over all these different set of basis states. So we have J1 Q. configurations of spin chains, and I'm just going to call that S for now. Uh, Alright, so this is supposed to be is the sum over all possible configurations of spins over the product of all the plaquettes of those spins. And what does that mean, right? Um, so this goes back to the idea I was talking about earlier about the plaquettes. Um, so just to kind of clarify this, um, kind of what this means real quickly, let's assume that I just had a two-dimensional spin system. Um, spins could be either up, which I'm going to denote as zero, down as one. And so what I had before, um, Z then uh, by just writing out this trace. Zero, zero, Q, and let's say I just broke Q up into two pieces. And I'm not going to write it all out because. <coughs> right. And so if you just continue that sum, eventually you get exactly what I have written here for LT equals 2 on two spin system, right? 
So then inserting resolutions of the identity in between those queues gives us something like 00, zero represented by a plaquette that we'll see a little bit better when we actually bring out the Brotlet representation. And this is like one possible configuration of spins. Um, so generally speaking, uh, the way the spin plaquette is equal to uh, the spin on the set J at imaginary time step L. This can be written as that when we have uh, this WSCP having that kind of form. But um, that's basically what that amounts to. Right. And so, um, what we want to do then is kind of figure out some kind of representation. Okay, actually calculating all of these possible plaquette weights and whatnot is going to take exponential amount of time if we want to do all of it precisely, right? So maybe we just want to look at the um, these weights that add the most to our sum. And so then we kind of draw a picture that sort of falls line along the lines of that uh, imaginary time step that we have. So we have say our four spins here. And this could be a larger spin system. So this is measure time step one, two, three. And then we kind of want to draw it on the grid. This is what's about to bring us to the sort of world line representation. So basically, at each of these imaginary time steps, we're kind of thinking about. Uh, you know, possible configuration. This is your system at successive steps in imaginary time. Yes, exactly. Or except at an inverse temperature. Yes, yep, steps in inverse temperature. Right. And so what we can do um, at each of these steps is kind of think, okay, maybe we could have something that's spin up here, something spin up here, here, and yeah, just kind of different possible places that you can have spin up, right? right so we want to figure out which of these configurations kind of contribute the most to our sum, right? And so what we kind of want to do then here is use what they call a, uh, a word line model, but I'm going to use a specific representation of that called the vertex. You said a word line model? A uh, word world line model. Right. So, well, what the world line model is, it's basically you draw a line from uh, that follows each of your spin ups, right? And so that, um, that would be something like that, maybe, right? But uh, updating things with the loop algorithm, which we want to talk about in a moment, works a little bit better if uh, we talk a little bit about loop okay. So the reason we broke this Hamiltonian into commuting pieces. Um, or pieces that at least approximately compute the tau is small enough, uh, is because 
once we have our world by model, oh, that's not. once we have our world by model, then we can kind of we can use that world by model sort of as a representation of row, kind of. Uh, that's not necessarily the best way to think of it, but um, you can kind of think of row as being a mixed state of these possible spin configurations. Again, that's not exactly what it is, so don't, don't quote me on that. But, um, yeah, and so what the point is, is that Before we get into how you actually make a specific world by model or how you update it with the Monte Carlo method, uh, what you can do basically is once you have this successive set of spin um, chains, then you can use that to calculate uh, this sum, assuming that you've found a successive set of spin chains that sort of adds a lot of weight to that sum by just adding the weight of each of these possible individual plaquettes on the model you have. Your question? Like you well, it, yeah, I mean, it, uh, you've lost me. Um, no. Also, we, 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 we do have a time problem. Can uh, you kind of maybe sum up or? OK. Um, yeah, uh, I can sum up how you actually calculate things and sort of um, or just give skip. an answer? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, just sort of skip. Um, yeah, they have to, uh, all right, so um, all right, on each of these packets, you have a uh, set of spins here and a set of spins there, right? And so that's kind of what each of these is. And so you have, let's say, the weight for, uh, we'll just call this placket of one. And that you can calculate um, with relative ease because you only have so many uh, spins that are actually active there. And um, so that's how you sort of calculate the weight of each of these plaquettes. And you then sort of approximate your um, overall sum by the like sum and product of the plaquettes that you have in your world line representation. And then. Um, so if you were, if you wanted to say calculate some particular observable R instead, you would have um, sort of a weight with respect to that observable R on um, one that's uh, and you, yeah, uh, and you do sort of the same thing, um, just get uh, these sort of modified weights and calculate them that way. Yeah, because I didn't really talk about the loop out but this is, uh, this is basics, the basics of the world line quantum quantum method. This is called world line quantum quantum yes. Monte Carlo? Yes, and the loop algorithm is a, is a sort of a specification uh, modification, actually, of the world Send something to the greater and to me. But quickly. Okay. Okay, who's next? Mine is real quick. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, projector. Oh, yeah, the screen. Oh, you've been turned um, on. It's on. Let's kill the lights. Let there be light. Today and over in Reaganer, and 
nobody there can get the goddamn computer to work. Um, <laughs> oh, I have not a black screen and two bright that? blue screens. Does it not do anything when you plug your machine into, into the sure. HDMI? It doesn't register on your machine? It registers, this is not the uh, projector. Okay, does anybody have a good idea? How to get this working? No, we could all gather on the screen. Okay. Yeah. If it's something well, online rather than on your well, computer. Well, I'm pretty sure like, you know, 3D models, you know. I'll be ready and plug it back in. Let me see if I can get it. Oh, <laughs> turn it on and off. Sure. That's not a bad idea. Also, turn that off. Just use the chalk on the projector screen. There we are, on markers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tom is not in his usual place. You have other adapters? Yeah, maybe maybe you just try to force your computer to like scan for any output. But sometimes it doesn't take the first time. Yeah, I'm pretty booting. Um, yeah, it would recycle the thing in some way that might. Oh, it's turning off. Don't turn the computer off. <laughs> it loads real quick. Tom, uh, we're having trouble getting uh, a student's uh, talk projected. Thanks. So he's coming. Uh, uh, that's what fixed it. So what did you do to fix it? Yeah. What did you do? <laughs> I just made it. Yeah. Restarted the computer? Yeah, I had reviewed it. That's right. <laughs> As soon as you request technical support, that's when the problem goes away. <laughs> okay. So Tom really did yeah, actually. Yeah, it's all been found that if Tom right. just comes into the room, right. the problem goes away. <laughs> just be safe. Is that the LHC? Then <laughs> <laughs> you power it up all the way. <laughs> like, um. Tom, if the problem has resolved itself, apparently uh, <laughs> just uh, saying your name in this room cured it. Uh, now to um, make sure it splits without showing. Uh, oh, it's just made your room instead of mirror. Oh, yeah, you can probably drag it over. Thanks. Oh, fuck. So, <laughs> <laughs> how many more talks do we have today? I think that's the last one. Yeah. Huh? He's the last one. He's the last one? Yeah. Okay. All right, look, maybe I'll say some things about strings while he's trying to get it working. Yeah. All right? Sure. As soon as you get it working, um, I'll stop. Um, let's see, maybe I'll just use the whiteboard, it might be easier. Which one of these works? Is this the one that works? So, a couple of things are that the string Nambugato action uh, is complicated and the momenta are complicated and so forth, but what saves you is that it's reparametrization and variance, so you can choose an arbitrary parametrization. And um, in particular, let me, let me sort of tell you about uh, one of them. Let me also uh, correct something that I said last time, which was wrong in response to one of your questions. <laughs> um, let me just clarify a brain here. Okay, suppose this is x3 equal to 0. Okay, and so we can have a string sort of doing this. Well, the brain is in the 1, 2 space. And these things can move around in the one two place. It's just that the ends of the string are restricted to x3 equals zero. That's the example, a nice example of a brain. Okay. All right.
backwards. I said it sort of backwards last time. Um, and the energy that I computed that was zero, that's the energy of the field, the Nambugato field. Oh, all right, well, we'll wait till you get yeah, yeah. That was the energy of the Nambugato field as opposed to the Nambugato stream. All right. Now, a useful parametrization is called static gauge. Um, oh my goodness, is that the only? That's a good pen, apparently. Well, we see that. Um, all right, what is static gauge? Static gauge is tau is t is capital X zero over c. That's a, that's called static gauge. The next thing you can do is choose the sigma parametrization so that you have two features that are convenient. One is that when the string is moving, every part of the string is moving transversely. Moving transversely. And um, And also so that the so the d sigma is equal to ds is length is a length element on the string, and you divide by the square root of one minus v perp squared over c squared. Whenever I say v perp squared, I think of um, the lingo in police stations where the perp is perpetrated. <laughs> Why police? The police use the longest possible words for every any particular issue. I don't know, but it's it's exactly the wrong way to speak. Um, now, in this parameterization, it's amazing. Um, first of all. Uh, X, which, boy, uh, <laughs> we can write this way, uh, is, well, X prime, the sigma derivative, is zero X vector prime. Vector means the spatial components. Good God, ready. this thing is terrible. Does the other one work any better? I think we're ready to. Yeah. All right. It'll only be like five. Okay. Like if you... five, five, seven minutes, really. All right. Go. Cool. All right. So, um, my is Daniel, and I. Daniel. Who's Daniel? Me. Yes. But you said Daniel and I. No. <laughs> and I am presenting a Monte Carlo simulation, which is basic um, concepts in a random walk simulation here. So what I um, permission. Uh, the whole emphasis of this whole project is to, you know, examine the step counter, you know, the number of steps in these, um, in this algorithm, and you know, comparing the uh, no, comparing high number of steps versus low number of steps. So, if I were to run the uh, random walk simulation um, for a low number of steps, you would get something that's much like this. And if you were to, and then if you were to examine a uh, radial probability distribution um, to where um, if you were to look at from the center, examine the set from the very center, you know, let's say like the very bottom right there, of, of each successive step, if you were to measure that, that radial distance, you know, and to plot that, and to find its probability, you would get something like uh, this here. You know, like you have this 0 0.03 um, for the x direction, and then you have a, a, a um, steadily increases upward in the y direction. And then it's pretty interesting here is that it has a nice Gaussian kind of curve in the z direction. And so if I, if I were to increase the number of steps, in a random distribution, increase the number of steps, I would get uh, something much more beautiful, actually. 
zoom in on this one. Yeah, so if I were to zoom in, you know, see what's going on, because you know it's all it's all cluttered. But if we were to zoom in, you know, you know, it's something that would look really So how many steps is this? This is uh, Uh, 100,000. 100,000 steps. Like that. And if I were to again measure the radial distribution from the very center, from the from origin of every single successive step and its rate of probability, uh, I would get an, actually a much less probability. You know, it's really low, like. 10 to the minus 3 in terms of real probability distribution. And what's really nice here is that you start to get even more nice fit Gaussian curves. So I mean, you're more fit than the other ones in the x and y and z direction. And if I were to use um, an actual Monte Carlo algorithm, the Metropolis Hasty rule, and plot that with, uh, with this um, norm PDF, this normalized uh, probability distribution, uh, get to these histograms. So, and, and we're plot these for histograms, I would get something with, with more steps, it's more Gaussian, while with less steps, it's like kind of like clunky, you know? So, that's all. Uh, so, do you? Yeah. <laughs> So send me, uh, send it to me and also to the grader. Okay. So was that the end of the talks? All right, I'll do ten more minutes of strings. Um, Professor, is that a better one? Okay, can you throw it here? And it is erasable, right? It's one, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so as I said. Uh, you can, when you adopt these gauges, well, in static gauge, you get this automatically. But if you um, go further and require that the velocities be transverse and choose this parametrization where v perp is the perpendicular velocity, then what you get is a remarkable thing, namely that the vector part uh, obeys the wave equation. So in other words, the vector part of the uh, string is just doing the wave, uh, is obeying the wave equation. And, uh, but there's a constraint, and the constraint is c squared times x prime vector squared plus x dot vector squared is c squared, so that's a constraint. And you remember the, the endpoint boundary condition. Um, the free endpoint, free means that you're not attached, that the end, the string is not attached to any brain. And so, instead of having a situation like this, you um, have the other endpoint condition, which is, um, P sigma mu of tor endpoints uh, equal to zero, and P sigma mu is um, the partial of the Nambugato action density with respect to x mu prime. Um, this condition, this constraint in this nice gauge. Um, is quite simple, and it's just the statement that x prime, the vector part of um, t and sigma star, that this is equal to zero. So <clears throat> this is the derivative with respect to sigma. So in other words, the as you change sigma, the position of the endpoint doesn't change at the endpoint. And uh, so it's in this gauge that we have this uh, a rotating string, T sigma is uh, sigma 1 over pi 
cosine pi sigma over sigma 1, and then times cosine pi ct over sigma 1 comma sine pi ct over sigma 1. That was the thing I wrote down last time. Then you can compute what the p's are and the angular momentum. And with in this gauge, then, the angular momentum is e squared over 2 pi c string tension. And this is the thing that, this says then that a relativistic classical Nambugato string has this regge behavior. And um, I gave you an example there of um, n through one of the, it, it had six, six baryons on a curve, which in fact was j uh, versus uh, e squared. Um, no, j plotted to, against e was a parabola. And um, the, the book, which I quite recommend by Barton uh, Zwiebach, um, who's at MIT, uh, he gives another example of, these are baryons, three quark systems. He gives an example of quark, anti-quark, a meson one, which also does the same thing and uh, fits very nicely on this line. Um, so let's see, what else? Oh yes, the, um, that thing that I said was a ghastly typo. It wasn't a ghastly typo, it was actually correct. Um, it's just that the formulas were so complicated that I didn't notice that in the second line, infinity had been replaced by two, which of course is a change. <laughs> But, um, all right, so let me show you, let me show you this equation now. And it has an interesting history. I mean, Riemann introduced his zeta function, and that was, I guess, sometime in the 19th century. And then in the 20th century, various people made improvements. And this guy named Sir, uh, apparently discovered and analytically continued the Riemann zeta function so that it was finite everywhere except at, uh, at, zeta e, at, at, at uh, z equal to 1, I think. And um, what he had was an infinite series. And so what he had was, so zeta of minus one, which is then the sum of n. And now it's not the sum of n that is the analytic continuation. The, the, the thing I'm computing here is Sir's formula. In other words, you take the Riemann zeta function, Sir extended it to an analytic function that's analytic everywhere except at z equal to one. You then evaluate that function of z at minus 1, and what you get is this series, which is minus a half sum on n from 0 to infinity, 1 over n plus 1, sum k equals 0 to n, minus 1 to the k, k plus 1 squared, binomial coefficient nk. Okay. Remarkable thing is, that when a is three, four, or higher, this whole damn thing is zero. So this sum is actually minus a half sum n equals zero to two of one over n plus one. Sum on k equals zero to n minus one to the k, k plus one squared n k, which is constant. So, I used my fingers this afternoon to compute what this is. And what I got was minus a half, one minus three halves plus two thirds. And indeed, this is minus one twelfth. So that's, um, that's the uh, result that, now, does, does this somehow make energies finite in string theory? I don't think so. Um, and in fact, uh, the people who do string theory don't really claim that. What they say instead is that the scattering amplitudes are finite. And I remember a lecture by Edward Witten, 
um, years ago in which he described two closed strings uh, scattering and what he gave then was what he pointed out was that there isn't any point in other words it's what somebody or other said about Los Angeles back in the 30s or 40s there's no there there so there's no point at which the two strings interact and, and there's no point of interaction because it's not a point interaction it's finite and uh, so that's that's certainly a nice thing about string theory um, and uh, it may be that one can explain the smallness of the new of Newton's couple Newton's gravitational coupling constant in terms of uh, by saying that the gravitons can go off into the big region whereas the uh, gluons and everything else are confined to um, some sort of uh, brain and so if we're if we're on a certain brain here uh, and the the gravitons instead go off the brain and so between here and here they not only do that but they also go off here and then come down then you can imagine that that the force between these two is one over r to some high power. I don't know. I'm 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 a little puzzled by the whole argument. I haven't thought about it enough recently to see. But it's um, it, there may be something there. I don't know. Um, okay. I think that's um, enough. So those of you who gave me presentations do agree that we do send them to me, to me and um, uh, I wish you all a safe summer and for those who came in late there's a lecture on super resolution uh, microscopy by a Nobel laureate in that field a week from today at 3.30 in room 103 of uh, Reagan Hall and um, if you're very new to this department, Reagan Hall is a disastrous underground building <laughs> that's uh, kind of near the intersection of, un of University and Central. Um, yeah, it's just across from the uh, School of Journalism. Yeah, and it's also just across from the engineering school and so forth. Um, so I would urge you all to go to that and um, uh, so have a nice summer and um, look both ways crossing streets and if any of you smoke cigarettes, quit. <laughs> um, that's more important than anything else except looking both ways when crossing streets. Okay, let's turn off the projector, uh, the uh, recording. Oh.